everybody, and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 165. Uh, this week the questions are taken from guide 220 to the main class battleships of the US Navy, and the accompanying Wednesday video on Greco-Persian navies. J.S. Remus asks, if the Canadian Naval Aid Bill of 1912 had been successfully passed, and the three Canadian Queen Elizabeth class battleships had been laid down as launched as soon as practicable, what would have been their impact in World War I, the Washington and London Naval Treaties, and World War II? The impact on World War I would be interesting, because if the bill is passed in 1912, well, parts of the Queen Elizabeth class weren't laid down until 1913, so potentially the Canadian Queen Elizabeth class would also be laid down at that point. At that, to be honest, at that point when you're building three additionals, in, uh, as well as the five that are already authorised, you might might also see Agincourt as originally planned, i.e. a slightly modified Queen Elizabeth built along the same lines. But three plus five is eight, which does give a rather nice division of two battle squadrons, so that might still be something for later on. Now, with those being laid down, that means, in 1913, that means they're probably going to be coming into service in 1915, which means that you will have eight Queen Elizabeth class available for the Battle of Jutland. Now, if we assume that Queen Elizabeth herself is going to be in dock the same way that she was uh, historically, obviously, with the ships coming into service in 1915 probably late 1915, they're not going to have a tremendous effect on the earlier part of World War I, but their first major engagement is probably going to be Jutland. And in that respect, it does pose the rather interesting quandary, because you could have things go one of two ways for Jutland, bearing in mind that the battlecruiser fleet needs to cycle its ships up to Scapa Flow for gunnery practice, you might see BT persuade Jellico to release both battle squadrons. So this would be now fifth and sixth battle squadrons of Queen Elizabeth class. In exchange, he would have to send all of the 12-inch uh, armed battle cruisers up. So all the invincibles and all the indefatigables. Now, that does raise some interesting possibilities, because if BT now has the battlecruiser fleet as Lion, Princess Royal, Queen Mary, Tiger, and eight Queen Elizabeths, then he would have to be completely and utterly mad not to actually signal them and get them in line, because otherwise he is outnumbered by the German battlecruisers. Assuming he shows some modicum of sense and does ma manage to ensure that they're all following him, that means that the German battlecruisers are now very badly outnumbered because there'll be 12 fast British capital ships bearing down on them, eight of which are Queen Elizabeth class. So the run to the south could go very, very differently indeed. It also means that, well, assuming that the bus flies don't spread too far and that first scouting group is still in some kind of position for some kind of run to the north you've then got two battle squadrons worth of invincible and indefatigable class showing up under rear admiral hood instead of just the one whether that'll save invincible or not is open to question but it almost certainly will save indefatigable all in all that's a bad day for hipper the other possibility of course is that jellico only allows BT to cycle up squadrons one at a time, so you end up with a historical run to the south and run to the north, except that the Grand Fleet now has an additional battle squadron of Queen Elizabeth class with it, which again has a couple of possibilities. They may follow Admiral Hood uh, with his third battle cruiser squadron, at which point Lutzow and Der Flinger are not only facing off against the three Invincibles, but also against the Canadian Queen Elizabeths, which could be very interesting again, and again a bad day for Hipper. Or, alternatively, um, possibly less likely, given the speed that these ships would be able to reach, Jellico might keep them just as part of the standard battle line, in which case that's kind of probably the, the least effect that they have on World War One because they're just adding more firepower to what's already overwhelming firepower with the sole caveat that 
between the fact that Queen Elizabeth have excellent gunnery as a whole, and obviously they're quite powerful in terms of their hitting power, you might end up with either the first or second encounters between Sheer and Jellico resulting in more damage to leading German capital ships, which might result in one or more German capital ships being sufficiently slowed that they are then sunk. So there's a whole range of possibilities there. And then afterwards, when they operate with the Grand Fleet, they look very impressive. Now, what effect they have on the Washington and London naval treaties and then World War II, this is a little bit more interesting because it, I think it's going to depend on who is actually in control of the ships by the end of the war. If they are, at the time, his Cana Cana Canadian Majesty's ships, or His Majesty's Canadian ships, then there's a very high possibility they might end up being scrapped. They, The Canadians would get a seat at the Washington Conference. Admittedly, it would be a fairly low seat. They'd be sort of probably be placed on the same kind of uh, restrictions as Italy or France or possibly even a lower tier carved out the Americans would be very reticent about the whole thing because they would obviously still see Canada as very closely allied with Britain and probably be very worried as they were historically with HMS Australia with Britain using the Canadian and Australian Navy standing separately as a way to artificially increase the overall effective British fleet but the main thing there is, I can't see, given the Canadian Navy's massive funding crisis in the 1920s and 30s, I can't see the Canadians being able to afford to keep them around, unless something really radically different has changed. And of course, if they are then scrapped, or if perhaps they end up, heaven forbid, being suffering the similar fate to HMS Australia then obviously they don't have any further effect on the treaties or World War II. Conversely, if the Americans demand and the British accede to treating them as part of the Royal Navy, regardless of whether or not they're Royal Canadian Navy or Royal Navy specifically, then they get incorporated into Britain's treaty allowance the most immediate effect of that is likely to be that the King George V World War I class gets scrapped immediately and it's instead the Iron Dukes that are on the chopping block for when Nelson and Rodney are completed. So minimal change to the Washington Treaty. When it comes to the London Treaty, however, things get a little bit more interesting because now you have five Revenge class, eight Queen Elizabeth class, plus Renown, Repulse, Hood, Tiger... Nelson and Rodney, which means that historically the British ended up having to scrap the Iron Dukes, but the Iron Dukes were already gone in the early 20s because Nelson and Rodney came in and you've got this eight strong Queen Elizabeth class. Given that, I don't think that the British are going to want to scrap the Canadian ships, and the Canadians are probably not too keen on it either because the Queen Elizabeth class is more useful to them in an interwar environment because of their speed than the R class is. But that does leave them with a bit of a quandary, because just looking at the 15-inch armed ships plus Nelson and Rodney, you now have 18 ships, and you need to cut that down to 15. And that's not including Tiger, so Tiger will have to go definitely, but then, do you scrap the battle cruisers? Very unlikely that that's going to be approved. And so that leaves you with scrapping some of the R's, which is going to leave you in the awkward position of having two R-class left, which is not really a homogenous squadron. But it's probably what the British are going to end up having to go for. So you'll probably end up with them taking the two best R-class and semi-modernising them, kind of like Royal Oak, how Royal Oak was historically. And then you'll go into World War II with eight Queen Elizabeths, some of which were demonized, plus Renown, Repulse, Hood, Nelson and Rodney. As far as an effect on World War II is concerned, it's going to depend on how modernised the Canadian ships have been, but even if they haven't been particularly modernised, 
then the oldest Queen Elizabeth, probably Barham and Malaya at that point, because the Canadians will probably be to a slightly modified, slightly more capable design, they're the ones who are going to have to take the role of the R's historically, so convoy escort and various other missions that are not directly facing the primary opponents, which then does give, say, the Mediterranean fleet a slight advantage, because instead of having to operate with some of modernised QEs, some older QEs, and some R's, which gives them a disparate battle line speed, if you've got a Mediterranean fleet that is, say, war spite plus two or three of the Canadian ships, and then perhaps later Queen Elizabeth and Valiant with one or two of the Canadian ships, that gives Cunningham a lot more strategic mobility because he now has a uniform 24 to 25 knot battle line, which potentially changes the outcome of some of the early battles like Calabria. It might also make Somerville a bit more aggressive during the Indian Ocean raid because instead of having a slow squadron and a slightly faster squadron, he'll now have the overall fleet being of approximately, again, 24 to 25 knot top speed since the two R's that are left, as I say, will probably be on convoy escort duty. So there could be a lot of butterfly impacts in World War II. Christopher Knoll asks, What is the history of ship-to-ship signalling, particularly between enemy ships? When did signals become standardised so that a particular signal would be understood universally? Signals only really became completely standardised in terms of sending complex messages in the mid-19th century. Before that, there were a few flags that were vaguely universally recognised, as well as a number of nations adopting other nations' signal code books or flag signal books. So you would have certain nations who could understand each other because they were using the same set of signals, but that wasn't a universal thing. Generally speaking, before the invention of those kinds of signals, you would have signalling between enemy vessels take place, obviously mostly with gunfire, but if they actually wanted to talk to each other, there were a few completely internationally recognised elements. So you could obviously strike your flag, which was a signal to surrender. Um, You could dip your flag. That basically involved using national flags in some way, shape or form to indicate say surrender willingness to talk or some other similar thing and then that would lead to either a boat going across from one party to the other or potentially even at points just hailing each other with megaphones just not obvious electronic ones but the old school ones over the water and conversation would be conducted that way obviously in times of peace then you could just sort of sail up to somebody and as long as your guns weren't run out you could just talk to them but in times of war there generally wasn't a fantastic amount of communication between enemy ships unless it was a case of i surrender please don't shoot me anymore or when combat had gone clo- to a close enough range that you could just yell across to the other side posen asks Given the losses sustained by the Imperial Russian Navy in the Russo-Japanese War, come 1914, just how effectively had the Tsar's Navy recovered for the outbreak of World War I? It depends which element of the Tsar's Navy you're looking at. The Black Sea Fleet was not massively impacted by the Russo-Japanese War. Obviously, the Pacific Fleet was pretty much wiped out. The Baltic Fleet took very heavy losses because they made up the bulk of the strength of the 2nd Pacific Squadron, but the Black Sea Fleet effectively didn't contribute anything to that effort, and so the Black Sea Fleet just kind of still existed pretty much as it was. The Pacific Squadron obviously was somewhat less relevant in World War I because suddenly the Japanese and the Russians found themselves on ostensibly the same side fighting the Germans. Uh, Weirdly enough, the Japanese would then sell the Russians two of their battleships that they'd lost to being captured at Tsushima. Um, well, Tsushima and, you know, salvaging the, what was left of the, the first Pacific Squadron. But anyway, they sold two battleships back to Russia in the middle of World War I, um, which was quite amusing. But it was the Baltic fleet that really needed to go through the biggest recovery period. They did get a couple of additional 
pre-dreadnoughts built, but most of their pre-dreadnought slate had or had been wiped clean by the Russo-Japanese War. That in turn meant that obviously the Ganguts were built for the Baltic Fleet as uh, for the first priority for the Russian dreadnoughts, followed by further dreadnoughts uh, built in the Black Sea. But whilst it didn't overall impact the Russians' dreadnought building project, other than perhaps influencing where the first ones would be built, and perhaps even granting them a little bit more um, in the way of funding because, you know, they didn't have the upkeep and running costs of those pre-dreadnoughts, it also meant they didn't have a large supply of pre-dreadnoughts with which to conduct supplementary and supporting operations. So this is why you saw, say in the Battle of Moon Sound, a very, very small number of Russian ships coming to oppose the Germans, whereas perhaps before, if you know the Battle of Tsushima hadn't happened, more particularly if the Borodino class hadn't been mostly lost, you might have seen a much stronger Russian response. The flip side to it is that the lessons that had been imposed by Tsushima did force the Russians to get innovative in terms of extending the range of their pre-dreadnoughts guns, because they didn't have that many of them anymore, and so you had to make the best of what you've got by inducing them to get coordinated fire squadron tactics amongst their pre-dreadnoughts, which is near enough unique in the annals of World War I. So it's a little bit difficult to judge. In terms of numbers, the Tsar's Navy had not recovered in the Baltic. In terms of firepower, obviously, a Gangut is significantly more powerful than any two Russian pre-dreadnoughts. But in terms of overall tactics and usage, weirdly enough, the Russo-Japanese war actually made the Russian Navy better because of these unique tactics they then came up with. The sole caveat to that is because they just had a lower number of vessels, it meant that they were perhaps a little bit more conservative in how they used the Baltic fleet in World War One against the Germans than they might have been if they'd had a significant number of ships still left. Pandastical asks, I know you don't do modern ships, but what do you consider modern? Is Korean War content now viable, for example? So I've gone into the reasons why I won't cover modern ships in the past, so I don't think I need to restate those here again. But in terms of modernity, I basically draw the line at where ships go from primarily gun-armed to primarily missile-armed. So I, if a ship has its origins in the 1940s, or perhaps the very early 1950s at a stretch, and then goes on to have a career that goes through the Cold War and in, perhaps even into the modern era, I'll cover it because... You know, it's originally started out back in the 40s, so it's a ship that I can talk about. And it's modern Korea, you just stick to the facts and hope that nobody really flips out about it. Now, Korean War content, I think the Korean War is probably a nice place to draw the line. Because, I mean, for one thing, yes, obviously there was plenty of naval involvement in the Korean War, but, you know, the North Korean Navy at the time, not exactly oh, the world's most terrifying force. So it's more shore bombardment, carrier operations against the land, base targets, etc. It's not a classic naval war, if you will. So I don't see there being a tremendous amount to cover relative, so that sort of matches relatively to the kind of content that the channel regularly produces it's so when you talk about ships if you sort of as a rough rule of thumb you look at something like the des moines or the worcester class they're kind of the last gun-based u.s cruisers that are built obviously you've got things like the albanese and and such like which do still have guns but they're now quite extensively using missiles so that's kind of the cutoff with carriers I think I'd be happy to go into something like the Forrestal class or the abortive USS America because fundamentally they are still recognisably outgrowths of the Midway's, uh, of the Midway design process, and I think they can just about fit. But that's kind of where I draw the line to mo- from from sort of gun based Age of Steam and Steel to modern missile and jet based uh, ships. 
Connor McLernan asks, do you think sail power has a future in the modern shipping industry? Quite possibly, if they want to reduce emissions, there are a lot of ways that you can use wind power to do that. When you say, when you say modern sailing, though, um, sail power... If you, I think if you loosely define it as using the wind to assist with the passage of ships, uh, I don't think there's going to be a return to something like what you see in the picture here, where ships are just covered in masts and sails for a couple of reasons. One is these days most cargo vessels are designed in such a way that having these would be severely detrimental to their uh, value as cargo vessels i mean if you can imagine most container ships these days where would you put the sails <laughs> the sails take up deck space deck space is where you put the cargo containers but also there's there's the other slightly complicating factor of ships of that time period were designed to deal with the amounts of heel that would be brought about by having you know some very long levers that were being acted on by some fairly large forces mounted to the top of your ship modern vessels are not designed for that so you'd have to redesign a cargo vessel if you wanted to operate with sails these days as opposed to using fairly standard designs that are in use at the moment which rely on engine power but with those caveats aside yeah there there are a number of ways that you can use wind power through flatner rotors or uh, kite sails or wing sails or aerofoil sails or whatever to reduce the amount of engine power that's required to get a ship moving from point a to point b and that can only be beneficial i mean from a, a obviously from a environmental standpoint less emissions is good less pollution is good and from an operational financial standpoint well wind power is free sure you pay an upfront cost to install the things on the ship but if you save 10 20 percent on your fuel bills or possibly more each year well you're saving money and that's also a good thing apparently <laughs> paul pomicala asks how much freeboard does a battleship need well freeboard can vary along a ship depending on the height of the hull at that point quarter decks of a lot of battleships were lower than the forecastle, for example but the forecastle freeboard height is usually the main thing that influences the sea keeping of a ship and in a dreadnought battleship and indeed most pre-dreadnoughts you generally see a freeboard of between 25 and 30 feet um, some ships will have a bit, bit more and those ships generally have much better sea keeping all other issues aside and if you're really going much below 25 feet, you are going to have significant problems with a lot of sea coming over your bow forward, which is not good for sea keeping or indeed keeping everybody else aboard dry. Sean Killian asks, what are the cylindrical structures on top of some World War II era destroyer and cruiser based torpedo launchers? What do they contain and why do some launchers not have them? These are generally blast shields, um, so to shield you against blast of guns and, in most cases, shrapnel and things like that, but not direct hits from shells, for the equipment that's used to train the torpedo launcher and set the torpedo settings as they are fired. As you can see here, as we switch the pictures, it's exactly the same torpedo launcher, only with the blast shield removed to see that you have a course indicator, the wheel that allows you to train the launcher, you can set the gyros for the torpedoes, so you can possibly set them for offset fire, set what depth they're going to go down to, and so forth and so on. And the reason you see them on some torpedo launchers and not others is all to do with where this equipment is positioned. So some on some launchers it's positioned right in the middle of all the torpedoes, in other launchers it's positioned to the side or just above the a one of the side mounted torpedo launchers so it might either be physically on the side of the whole tubes or it might be mounted on the first or last torpedo tube so sometimes you would have someone actually physically standing or sitting on top of the whole thing and controlling it and other times the person controlling it might either be standing either on a little side platform mounted to the side of the launcher or perhaps even standing independently of the tube, um, although that's a little bit more hazardous. And so 
if the, whether or not this equipment equipment is exposed and whether or not it's covered by some kind of blast shield is down to the individual navy and sometimes even down to the individual class where you have the kind of side mounted low profile units where someone's standing sort of partially in line with the torpedo launcher you don't tend to notice it that much whereas if someone's mounted it directly on top of uh say a four or five tube launcher system and then stuck a blast shield on top it's a lot more noticeable damien porosky asks planes can have a propeller both on the front or on the back to move them through the air why are there no ships as far as i know that have screws on the front of the ship or a push-pull design it's all to do with efficiency. When you're dealing with water, which has slightly different properties as a fluid compared to air, not just because of density, but because of the relative incompressibility of water, you face two major issues with a tractor configuration prop as opposed to a pusher configuration prop. One of which is that whilst, as you can see here, it is possible to have the propeller protrude and on a relatively fine angle so the fine angle you need for the bow is not necessarily so much of a problem but if you're talking about a large ship where you need multiple propellers poking out that is going to increase the um, surface area of the forward part of the ship which is going to create more drag which is going to slow you down plus it also means you've got to run machinery well, either machinery or propeller shafts through the forward part of the ship, which is going to increase the weight of the bow, which in turn, unless you really like diving your bow into the water all the time, is going to require a fuller bow, which is going to, again, require you to um, either slow down, except to slower speed, or require more power for the same speed, which is, again, somewhat inefficient, because bows, generally speaking, tend to be a little bit finer than ship sterns. But the other major problem is friction. And you might think, well, water reduces friction. Well, yes, between dry objects or objects with water between them, it might reduce friction. But there is still friction between water and the hull of a ship as the ship passes through the water or the water flows past the ship one way or the other. And that level of friction, which obviously translates into resistance, translates into efficiency, is related to the speed of difference between the water and the hull now in a pusher configuration where which is conventional the ship's propeller is mounted right aft then the water that's being propelled by that propeller is of course going to be going faster than the ship is going forward because as we know for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction the propeller is pushing water backwards and the opposite reaction pushing the ship forwards so for the kinetic energy equation to be balanced a ship has a certain mass it's now moving at a certain velocity that gives it a certain amount of kinetic energy but the amount of water at any given time that the propeller is pushing backwards is of significantly smaller volume than the ship itself just look at the you know the overall underwater volume of the ship and the cross-sectional area of a ship underwater compared to the cross-sectional area of the ship's propellers and therefore, because it has less volume and and water is not as dense as metal, uh, the amount of water that's being pushed backwards, the mass of the water is going to be less than the mass of the ship at any given point, which means that for the, that kinetic energy equation to balance, the velocity must be greater. Now, the, all of that is important because... If you have a tractor configuration propeller forward, then the water that flows across the hull is going to be faster than it is normally. Because if the ship is, let's say, moving at 30 knots and using an arbitrary figure, and it's not a direct relationship via mathematics, but just using an arbitrary figure, for example, if the water that's being kicked out by the propellers is going at 40 knots, well, that doesn't matter to a pusher configuration ship, a conventional vessel, but it, the water that's moving past the ship that's moving at 30 knots will exert a certain amount of friction. If you then switch that round, so it's now a tracked configuration propeller, the water is now being propelled backwards over the ship's hull at 40 knots, which means there's actually increased friction, which means increased resistance from the ship's passage through the now 40 knot water, so for the same amount of power 
you're not actually going to have the ship move through the water as a relative value as fast. The water flowing past the ship might be 40 knots, but your overall rate of advance will actually be maybe, let's say for arbitrary example reasons, 27, 28 knots. And that is not a good thing. Broadly speaking, for large ships, if you have exactly the same propeller configuration mounted pushing backwards after the ship or pulling the ship forwards and everything stuck forward of the ship, your tractor configuration ship will be about 10% less efficient than your stern-mounted conventional pusher-mounted uh, configured vessel. David Fuller asks, how were very large muzzle-loading guns on ships like HMS Thunderer reloaded? Seems like they're too big to fully withdraw into the turret. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> These guns did present something of a problem, and there were numerous attempts to solve this problem that were enacted by various navies, but one of the most common, which spread through pretty much all navies that still retained large um, rifled muzzle loaders, although to be fair, by the time this came about, that was pretty much the Royal Navy, was, as you can see here, a rather complex hydraulic system whereby the charges and the shells were loaded by rams that were placed under the deck next to the guns. Now, exactly where these uh, hydraulic rammers were placed depended on the ship class and the size of the gun, but usually it was either directly in front of or directly behind the turret. And so you'd have to fire the guns. The guns would then have to be rotated in the turret to a position where they lined up with the reloading mechanism because this reloading mechanism wasn't going to be on a carousel going all the way around the turret then the guns would have to be lowered into this little pit and then the new ammunition would be loaded into the guns which could then elevate and rotate back to point at the enemy it's one of the many and various reasons why gunfire in the 1870s and 1880s on turret mounted ships with large rifle muzzle loaders was not exactly going to be the most rapid of in, uh, firings. Now this did have some problems unlike a breech loader it was impossible for the gun crew to check if the guns had been double loaded and indeed on Thunder that was a problem. The forward gun exploded at one point because it had accidentally been double loaded and there was no way for anybody to check if that had happened other than pulling the trigger and then you know an explosion making it fairly obvious that this had in fact occurred. Now this kind of offset loading system for guns did actually persist to a certain degree even after rifle muzzle loaders gave way to breech loading rifled guns in as much as as you can see here the, the gun cradle is quite a substantial beast and in the era of the fully armored turret and even in the era of the early uh, fu um, fully armoured barbette which later becomes the turret that we all know and love in the dreadnought era there were issues with getting ammunition up from directly underneath the vessels but uh, underneath the guns both because the vessels were somewhat smaller than they would be later on and also because the turrets were relatively small and cramped compared to uh, what would come later and so when you have a look at say uh, the majestic class battleships turret they have this kind of weird lozenge or egg shape and that's because the loading mechanisms are for the shells to come up the hoists and everything are actually positioned well behind the guns to the extent that it actually you know, distorts the overall shape of the turret and so you end up with uh, this kind of offset and the fact that again like with these the Majestics needed to return their main guns to a fixed loading position uh, before rotating back to face at the enemy. As time went on, as guns got bigger and as the balance point for the guns got further forward in the turrets, the loading mechanisms could be more centrally located within the turret and also between the guns, and that this whole kind of issue went away and then you could have all around loading for the guns which was a great advantage when it came to you know firing your guns more than once every well should we say having an rpm that could be measured in rounds per minute rather than rounds per hour and leave it at that matt kidd asks at the end of the film master and commander lucky jack learns that the crew captain of the akron is disguised and held captive by the prize crew and is concerned they might overwhelm the prize crew and retake the ship 
Are there any historical examples of something like that happening? Yes, actually, there's quite a few. It wasn't that it was spectacularly common in terms of overall numbers of captures, but then again, the vast majority of captures in the Age of Sail were of merchantmen, which obviously would have a smaller crew to start with and a less combat-capable one, so obviously they're not going to be rising up against their captors as much as captured warship crews. Now, amongst warship crews, it was viewed as a somewhat dishonourable thing to do since you had given your surrender. However, when something was at stake that was as important as a major capital ship, then rules sometimes did go out the window. Uh, for example, uh, after Trafalgar, at least one, possibly more, but I can definitely recall at least one of the captured Franco-Spanish ships did end up in a situation where the the captured crew tried to rise up against the prize crew during the storm that blew up afterwards. Didn't do them a lot of good, but they tried. And these kinds of things did semi-regularly happen with captured warships. It was therefore obviously one of the reasons why if you did capture a warship you would tend to take it to port yourself or else put a very strong prize crew aboard. There's also the fact, you know, in most fights you would have taken enough damage that you yourself would probably want to go back into port for repairs as well. But it was very unusual unless it was a case of, I don't know, a big frigate or a small ship of the line capturing a sloop or something. Um, other than those kind of extreme circumstances, it would usually be not so common for them to capture a ship and then send it off back to a prize court if it was just um, the prize crew aboard a warship. So in the case of Surprise and Acheron, it's, well, actually, especially in that case, because Surprise is a smaller ship than Acheron, you would normally expect the Surprise to escort the Acheron into port so therefore the prize crew would be supervising it and if the captured crew tried to pull any shenanigans then obviously surprise was right there to reinforce the point that no in fact you hadn't surrendered but occasionally circumstances would dictate that the captured and capturee well the capturer and the captured would separate and then occasionally you would have the circumstances for an uprising Bajaki Hill Marson asks, when did the Navy switch from Morse to, vo to voice in radio communications, short distance, battle, etc.? I'm pretty sure I either answered this question or one very much like it in the last set of dry docks, um, but in the event that I missed it or it's a subtly different question, the short answer is I don't know exactly. Uh, certainly pretty much all radio communication that was done at any kind of great distance in World War One was done by Morse code or some other similar signal variation. Voice radio, of course, could be done in World War One as a one-way thing, as broadcast signals, but of course can't be encrypted, so wasn't particularly much use for tactical purposes. Whereas World War Two, certainly there were some short-range radio voice communication systems. But, to be honest, because of the operational security issues and because of the very limited range that you could get as a clear two-way signal through, it was generally the case that outside of a few unique circumstances at sea, you'd still use... Um, normal signaling methods, whether that be uh, Morse code on the radio, flags, lights, etc., etc. I'd say things like small things like PT boats, MTBs, that kind of thing would occasionally use voice uh, radio, but the ranges at which a ship operates, even at what would notionally be considered point blank, unless you are something like an MTB, are still much greater than on land. So for a tank or something, yeah, you might have a a voice radio and it might work at a few hundred yards maybe a couple of miles range or something like that but for a ship a communication system that works at a couple of miles range is generally pretty useless because in 99.9 .9 percent of all events anyone you want to communicate with is going to be a lot more than two miles away from you you don't want people listening in because you know um inverse square rule is a thing and if there are people within that kind of range or you've got a already pre-established system of communications in terms of flags and signal lights or even horns uh, 
that's a lot harder for an, any nearby enemy to crack. Obviously, um, encryption for voice radio messages did improve as things went on, but that moves beyond the scope of the channel into the Cold War era. Commodore Squid asks, I'm from Missouri, so there isn't much naval connection outside of BB-63, so I was curious if we've made any other contributions to maritime history of note, native Missourians or otherwise. Well, I don't know the ins and outs of the exact states of origin of various U.S. naval officers, unfortunately. Uh, what I do know is that the USS Missouri, the Iowa-class battleship, was preceded by at least two previous U.S. Navy ships. Admittedly, one of them was a steam frigate that whose main lesson in life was probably to teach the U.S. Navy a few important lessons about fire safety, which isn't necessarily brilliant, but the other one was a pre-dreadnought battleship, as can be seen here, which gave the U.S. Navy some pretty good service. And at least three U.S. admirals came from Missouri. Probably a few more, but I was able to confirm at least three uh, for the World War II period. So that's definitely a decent enough contribution, I would say, to the U.S. Navy, in addition, of course, to potentially other admiral rank officers, but certainly a lot of lower ranked officers as well, who also made valuable contributions to the U.S. Navy over the course of its existence. John Graubard asks, assuming that Admiral Spee avoided the Falklands and somehow made it back to Germany with his squadron in early 1915, would he have been named to command the High Seas Fleet, or the scouting group with Hipper in charge of the High Seas Fleet, and how would this have affected Jutland? I mean, it's entirely possible. I think I have answered a question similar to this before, but basically what it breaks down to is that Spee is senior to Scheer, assuming he survives, obviously, by about a month, but he does have that flag seniority just. Um, he's about 10 months uh, junior to Von Pohl. Now, this is the thing. When Admiral Ingerhol is relieved of command, who replaces him? Um, it's obviously not going to be Scheer. Uh, Scheer replaces uh, Von Pohl about a year later. But you would have an interesting situation where if... Spey has made it back he's going to be a very well-known hero but von Pohl has the seniority so it's it's possible that Spey takes over command of the high seas fleet in early 1915 but i don't think so because apart from anything else von Pohl is probably going to be in post by the time Spey gets back uh, assuming that he gets back at some point in early 1915. Now, what would then happen, most likely, Spey will be debriefed, etc. He's much senior to Hipper, but Hipper's already got the scouting group. So I suspect probably Spey would be given command of one of the battle squadrons of the High Seas Fleet. And then when Von Pohl is relieved because he's gotten badly ill at the beginning of 1916, then... Spey would probably then succeed to command of the High Seas Fleet because he has got that very slight technical uh, seniority of rank over Sheer and he will still have his popular reputation going for him. So at that point, yeah, it, it will probably almost certainly be Spey in command of the High Seas Fleet, um, Sheer a very able battle squadron commander and then um, Hipper in command of first scouting group. In terms of how that would have affected Jutland, I mean, it's difficult to say because Shear was bold, but also cautious, which sound, sounds like a bit of a oxymoron, but Shear was determined to take the High Seas Fleet out to battle. He also knew full well what kind of battles it couldn't win. So I guess the other way, other way of putting it was he was bold, but he wasn't stupid. Um, so he he definitely knew when to call it a day. Von Spey is very much cut from the same cloth. Um, perhaps, I mean, it's difficult to tell, obviously, because he had a relatively limited wartime career, but he strikes me perhaps on the basis of what we do know of him as maybe just a fraction more conservative than Sheer, but definitely a lot bolder than Von Pohl, uh, because obviously he was willing to take on Craddock at Coronel, but equally he was definitely not willing to take on the battle cruisers either australia or the congos 
and he also was not particularly au fait of his chances of taking on Craddock if Canopus was around. Um, so if Spey is in charge at Jutland, probably everything would go similarly in the initial part of things. The only thing that I can see possibly Spey agonising a little bit more over which she didn't so much would be how strung out the high seas fleet was getting um, with the Nassau's and Helgoland's falling back a little bit and the pre-dreadnoughts falling back even more so that that would probably be where you'd see the first big difference because obviously when Hipper said you know I'm drawing the British uh, battle cruisers down towards you Shear was prepared to take the latest and greatest German battleships ahead and wait and sort of let the the rest catch up for the opportunity to take out the British battle cruiser fleet. Von Spee certainly is tactically decisive enough to recognise the opportunity and may well have taken it. He but he also may well have concluded that perhaps the Grand Fleet was out there or a large element of it was out there somewhere and he should keep his fleet together which might then slow them down while he waits for the others to catch up and if that happens well probably nothing good for Hipper because it means he's going to have to be running further south with fifth battle squadron merrily pounding away on his battle cruisers and when the high seas fleet does come into sight because they're going slower it's going to give fifth battle squadron and the what's left of the battle cruiser fleet a bit more time to haul around and get north and all of that delay is also going to mean that Jellico has more time to form up his battle line in a more compact and straight manner which might then cause more damage to the high seas fleet and so on and so forth so upon a very small tactical decision could things go a lot worse for the germans but you know equally uh, as was seen at Coronel, von Spee knew exactly when to take an opportunity when one presented itself, and he had a fairly good sense of timing. So he may well have gone after the British the same way that Shear did, in which case Jutland probably plays out, at least during the day, very similarly to how it plays out um, in in history. The big question in my mind would be then come the evening, would Sheer, well, Sheer, we know what he did. He went south southwest and then thought that he was being followed, so tried to break east. And then you got the whole nighttime shenanigans going on, as well as the second encounter with the British battle line before dusk. Would Spey do that, or would Spey head straight south? And see, this is an interesting thing because if Spey heads straight south, then you're not going to get the second encounter with the British battle line, and therefore you're not going to get the death ride. Of the battle cruisers, but you're also not going to get the nighttime encounters with the rear skirmishing elements. But if Von Spee does just go, you know what, we're going straight south, that's where Jellico thought the Germans were going, so and was moving to cut them off. So, in that scenario, again, on a very minor decision, you might end up with things going roughly as historically, or you might end up with there being one big gun clash that day then a whole bunch of pursuit, and then there being a second big clash the next day when Jellico cuts off the high seas fleet from its base. So it's a lot of interesting thought exercises. Ger Variola asks, um, I think in July, uh, when I asked a question on what the rods on the side of early dreadnoughts and some pre-dreadnoughts were, uh, I didn't get an answer. But for September, I'd like to ask if any Navy evaluated or tried to build ships bigger than destroyers with torpedoes as their main armament and well the answer is yes depending on the contemporary period you thought i was going to put a picture of kitakami up here but whilst the kitakami was indeed converted into a torpedo cruiser with no less than 40 long lances aboard there were a number of other experimental vessels larger than destroyers for their time period that were used as primarily torpedo armed warships or attempted to be so in the 19th century there was a whole string of torpedo cruisers which were small protected or in a few cases unprotected cruisers whose primary armament was torpedo launchers and they were bigger than the torpedo boats and torpedo boat destroyers at the time albeit by 
World War One, World War Two standards, they still weren't massive, but everything scaled up during that period. Then you have designs in the 1910s for torpedo battleships, um, which, as the name suggests, battleship primarily designed as a torpedo-equipped vessel. The U.S. Navy had a number of those designs put forward, but decided that it was probably not the best of ideas and went with the conventional gun-armed ship. And the reason there's an aircraft carrier during all of this is because during its conversion from a battleship to an aircraft carrier, HMS Eagle was visited by that renowned ship design genius Admiral Beatty, who had the bizarre idea of equipping it with over a dozen torpedo launchers in a slightly misguided belief that somehow a large slow aircraft carrier would make an excellent night battle action ship to take on enemy cruiser squadrons by spamming torpedoes in every direction during the time when its aircraft couldn't fly. Again, this was overruled and a slightly more useful aircraft carrier was built out of the Eagle instead. But yeah, the idea of a ship with a primary armament of torpedo batteries it comes and goes throughout the years. And as for the uh, rods on the side of pre-dreadnoughts and early dreadnoughts question, that uh, I did answer at the time, um, <laughs> has been asked a fair bit. Those are, of course, uh, torpedo net booms, uh, which went away when the torpedo net self-deployed by ships went away in the early dreadnought period. Jim Smitty asks... Why did Jean de Laborde not give the order to the French fleet at Toulon to raise steam and make for Allied ports in North Africa? Even with the needed refits those ships would have needed, they would have given the Allies a boost in their ability to support later invasions in Europe, which would have helped free France from the Nazis, which by this point had made it clear that no piece of paper was going to stop them from doing what they wanted. So why scuttle the fleet when giving them the order to make steam and make for North Africa? Simply put, uh, Laborde was told to bring the French fleet to North Africa to join the Allies. He was told that by Darlan, believe it or not, because although Darlan had been very wishy-washy as to what exactly his intentions were during the fall of France, he had seen which way the wind was blowing and was seeking to collaborate with the Allies during Operation Torch. The problem was Laborde hated Darlan specifically. There was extremely bad blood between the two of them and secondly um laborde was oh the what's the best way to put it there are various degrees of officers in the french navy some were fairly pro-british and wanted to join the allies even in uh, 1940 when france fell you had others like darlan who were france first france above all um, and you know, to hell with the rest of you, which didn't help him, as it turned out, But uh, and there's some very wishy-washy command-making decisions, but nevertheless is an understandable position. And then you have people like Labour, who was not just obviously pro-France, because he was French, he was virulently anti-British. Uh, he'd spent the intervening time period between uh, the fall of France and this point arguing for French counterattacks on various um, Allied uh, holdings and various uh, places where the Allies had taken French colonial holdings. He basically wanted to declare war on the Allies alongside the Axis powers. And during the run-up to the scuttling of the fleet at Toulon, there were even protests aboard his ships by sailors who said no we want to go and join the allies we want to fight the germans and laborde suppressed and repressed those protests he was much much more pro-german um to the point that he, at one point he actually even issued a request to the luftwaffe to give him air cover for sailing out to attack the allied fleet um that didn't happen uh, obviously as it turned out um uh, and he was constantly pressuring uh, his superiors to let him go and attack the Allied fleets. And they were basically saying, no, <laughs> you, you can't do that. Um, which was probably for the best, considering that, as they rightly pointed out, the French had no night 
fighting doctrine, no radar, no modern anti-aircraft defences, and the Allies had all of those, so probably wouldn't have ended too well anyway. But, so when Labor was given this order, you know, go and join the Allies, that was about the last thing he was going to do. He basically hid behind the idea that, oh, he had to receive this order from Petain himself and nobody else, um, in fully intending, it seems, to stay in Toulon until, as far as he was concerned, France saw the light and joined Nazi Germany. But then Nazi Germany decided they'd had enough and were, they were going to take over the French fleet. And whilst Labour was ver was probably in ascending order from lowest to greatest, pro-Axis, massively anti-British, but as most French officers were, above all else, pro-France, um, eventually, even though he didn't initially believe that the Germans were coming to take over his fleet, once it was clear that they were coming to take over his fleet, he was determined, well, you know, I'd much rather have fought the British uh, at your side, but if I can't do that, you aren't going to have my fleet any more than the British are going to have my fleet, and hence he ordered it to be scuttled. It's not not an officer you can have a great deal of respect for, given the circumstances, especially considering literally everybody else, including his like, his crew, his officers, and his immediate naval superiors were all saying, go join the Allies, and he just sat there and went, no, I hate them, I'm not going to do it, and ended up having to blow up his fleet because of it, which is why after the war he got convicted of, of treason and sentenced to death, although that sentence was commuted later on. Liam Johnson asks, how did smoke generators on destroyers and cruisers work? Well, if you have a look at episodes 127, 133, and I believe 137, um, there are some questions there where I talk quite a bit about smoke screens and how they're generated um, aboard various ships. So I'd recommend those for a more comprehensive picture. But very briefly here smoke generators could take the two forms uh, on destroyers and cruisers so you could have an independent chemical smoke generator which acted completely independently of the ship rest of the ship systems that was usually mounted on the stern and the other way for a destroyer or cruiser to lay smoke was to vary the output of the funnel um, so you could do that a couple of ways you could starve the boilers of oxygen um, to a certain degree, and that would result in incomplete combustion of fuel, which would result in a lot of black smoke. Or you could achieve the same effect effectively by dumping extra oil into the fires, which has the same effect, incomplete combustion, without having to restrict the oxygen supply to the boilers. So that gives you black smoke. Or you could um, dump oil straight into the funnel where the hot exhaust gases are going and much like spilling oil on your car engine that generates a lot of white smoke so those would be the three ways in which you could generate smoke for a destroyer cruiser independent smoke generator or generate white or black smoke depending on what you were trying to hide from using your engines and funnel Adam Schindler asks, It seems as if the idea of using submarine screens to intercept and engage enemy heavy surface units advancing upon one's own fleet prior to a pitched battle was persistently popular through both world wars, particularly by less powerful combatants. Despite these efforts, my recollection of history seems to support few of these encounters actually occurring, and even then mostly as chance encounters rather than as planned interceptions of the battle fleet. The events I can recall are Ark Royal and Royal Oak being sunk by the Germans, neither really being an interception, Yorktown and Wasp, which happened essentially after the end engagement, so they don't meet the definition either, the radio reports of the Japanese and subsequent sinkings of Taiho and Shikaku during the Battle of the Philippine Sea seem to be the closest to an interception, but these actions seem to be regarded as a sideline to the main thrust of carrier-based attack. Was the fundamental idea flawed, or did it work in practice as well as it could have been hoped in slightly different form than was originally envisaged. It's a good idea in theory, but very difficult to pull off in practice. The reason it's a good idea is fairly obvious. I mean, if you've got a bunch of submarines, they're obviously much harder to spot. They're armed with torpedoes. If you can get them in position to intercept an enemy fleet, launch a surprise torpedo attack at a point when the fleet is guaranteed to be in relatively close formation, you're either 
minimum going to badly disrupt their formation, which makes your own fleet attack much more likely to succeed and cause a lot of damage. And at best, you're going to hit multiple enemy ships with multiple torpedoes, thus crippling or destroying portions of the enemy fleet before they even get within gun range of your fleet. So what's not to like about the idea? The fundamental problem is getting your subs in a position to intercept the enemy fleet. That is the crux of the problem. Um, it's not that the idea is a bad bad one, it's that the differential in speed between submarines and warships is almost always too great um, during this time period. Now, when I say almost, there and you know there are other a couple of other instances like um, the sinking of HMS Barham um, in the Mediterranean which is, again, probably the closest you can get, but even then it's a chance encounter. So fundamentally what the, the problem that the Japanese have in World War II, the Germans have in World War I, etc., is that you have to know where the enemy fleet is going to be well ahead of time because even surfaced, your submarines can't keep up with the battle fleet. So you have to deploy them well ahead of time and try and draw the enemy into a battlefield of your own choosing. And given how limited uh, speed the submarines have once they're underwater, you have some fairly major problems because, as the Germans found with Jutland, a single course change, even a few minutes before a ship's going to come into a firing solution, can be enough to carry an entire fleet past your submarine's ability to respond and that's if you're lucky enough to be in their path in the first place this is why although the k-class in practice as historically panned out were far from a success <laughs> to put it mildly the original thinking behind them was kind of sound and they probably did have a niche to occupy, as I've said before in previous dry docks, for a few months before that niche went away. And that's purely because they actually had the speed to keep up with the surface fleet. And what that means is you no longer had to worry about pre-positioning your subs and then drawing the enemy over them. In theory, at least, the K-Class could keep up with the fleet... They could sail with the fleet, and then when the scouting elements found the enemy fleet, then they could submerge. Okay, with the steam plants, it would take them a bit of a while to do so, but on the scale of ground fleet engagements in World War One, you probably did have the time, to be fair. And then they were, they were in position. They were where you knew they needed to be, i.e. in front of your own fleet, with the enemy fleet coming towards them, because of all the reports you've got from your scouting position, scouting forces. And then they can launch their attack, and then hope they don't get mistaken for friend, uh, for enemies by your own ships later on. The problem, apart from the operational issues with the K-Class, which is separate to their concept, was that they briefly achieved this kind of 21-knot speed, which was the average speed of the battle line, just in time for the average speed of the battle line to change, because pretty much as soon as they started coming online, you had the Washington Treaty going on, or the run-up to it, and then once that had all panned out, it turned out that the Royal Navy battle line was R-Class, Queen Elizabeth's battle cruisers, Nelson and Rodney coming along, a handful of 13.5-inch ships left over, but they weren't really considered part of the overall battle line if they could avoid it. And that meant that now the maximum rate of advance of the ship of the fleet was limited by the R class and then Nelson and Rodney, which was 23 knots, not 21. And once again, <laughs> submarines were too slow to keep up with the fleet. To be fair, they could have kept up with the US Navy fleet because they had standard class, which were all limited to 21 knots. Um, but almost everybody else's fleet, uh, as far as the big powers were concerned, Japan and Britain, they were faster. The Italians too, for that matter. Um, so, at that point, the K-Class fell back into effectively the same realm as everyone else. So they couldn't keep up with the fleet, um, would have problems positioning as a result thereof, and that was on top of all the various specific design and mechanical issues that the K-Class themselves had. 
So if somebody had been able to develop a 21 knot submarine, at least 21 knot surfaced, in 1914, then there would have been a place for them in this kind of submarine-based fleet interception in the First World War. And if there had been any major full-on fleet actions in World War II, then such submarines could have had a role there as well, although they would have then, for the most part, needed at least a surface speed of 25 to 26 knots, possibly more. Um, and obviously with aircraft and later radar and stuff like that, the advantages of bringing surface subs in and then diving became less and less and also obviously even in world war ii their submerged speed wasn't that much greater than the submerged speed in world war one for most of the war and with the higher surface speed of most capital ships of the second world war it meant that the speed differential was a lot greater so the potential of enemy ships going somewhere you didn't want them to be was also much greater so i think the sweet spot for when the idea would have been useful would have been world war one itself as i say if someone could come up with a 21 knot plus uh submarine that could achieve that speed on the surface and ideally maybe at that size pack a few more batteries so it can get more than four or five knots underwater as well but there's a bit of a secondary one and that brings us to the end of this week's dry dock thank you very much for listening everybody at the end of the Patreon dry dock next week, look forward to the announcements of the winners of the 250k subscribers competition, uh, if indeed you survive that dry dock. But other than that, have a nice weekend, have a nice week, and see you again in another video.